Into the Wild, Chapter 2, The Stampede Trail. Jack London is King, Alexander Supertramp, May 1992. Graffito carved into a piece of wood discovered at the site of Chris McCandless's death. Dark spruce forests frowned on either side of the frozen waterway. The trees had been stripped by a recent wind of their white covering of frost, and they seemed to lean toward each other, black and ominous in the fading light. A vast silence reigned over the land. The land itself was a desolation, lifeless, without movement, so lone and cold that the spirit of it was not even that of sadness. There was a hint in it of laughter, but of a laughter more terrible than any sadness. A laughter that was mirthless as the smile of the Sphinx, a laughter cold as the frost and partaking of the grimness of infallibility. It was the masterful and incommunicable wisdom of eternity, laughing at the futility of life and the effort of life. It was the wild, the savage, frozen-hearted Northland wild. Jack London, White Fang. On the northern margin of the Alaska Range, just before the hulking ramparts of Mount McKinley and its satellites surrender to the low Kantishna Plain, a series of lesser ridges known as the Outer Range sprawls across the flats like a rumpled blanket on an unmade bed. Between the flinty crests of the two outermost escarpments of the Outer Range runs an east-west trough, maybe five miles across, carpeted in a boggy amalgam of muskeg, alder, thickets, and veins of scrawny spruce. Meandering through the tangled, rolling bottomland is the Stampede Trail, the route Chris McCandless followed into the wilderness. The trail was blazed in the 1930s by a legendary Alaska miner named Earl Pilgrim. It led to antimony claims he'd staked on Stampede Creek above the Clearwater Fork of the Toklet River, in 1961, a Fairbanks company, Utan Construction, won a contract from the new state of Alaska, statehood having been granted just two years earlier, to upgrade the trail, building it into a road on which trucks could haul ore from the mine year round. To house construction workers while the road was going in, Utan purchased three junked buses, outfitted each with bunks and a simple barrel stove, and skidded them into the wilderness behind a D9 caterpillar. The project was halted in 1963. Some 50 miles of road were eventually built, but no bridges were ever erected over the many rivers it transected, and the route was shortly rendered impassable by thawing permafrost and seasonal floods. Utan hauled two of the buses back to the highway. The third bus, was left about halfway out the trail to serve as a backcountry shelter for hunters and trappers. In the three decades since construction ended, much of the roadbed has been obliterated by washouts, brush, and beaver ponds, but the bus is still there. A vintage international harvester from the 1940s, the derelict vehicle is located 25 miles west of Healy as the Raven flies, rusting incongruously in the fireweed beside the Stampede Trail, just beyond the boundary of Denali National Park. The engine is gone, several windows are cracked or missing altogether, and broken whiskey bottles litter the floor. The green and white paint is badly oxidized. Weathered lettering indicates that the old machine was once part of the Fairbanks City Transit System, Bus 142. These days, it isn't unusual for six or seven months to pass without the bus seeing a human visitor, but in early September 1992, six people in three separate parties happened to visit the remote vehicle on the same afternoon. In 1980, Denali National Park was expanded to include the Kantishna Hills and the northernmost Cordillera of the Outer Range but a parcel of low terrain within the new park acreage was omitted, a long arm of land known as the Wolf Townships, which encompasses the first half of the Stampede Trail. Because this seven by 20 mile tract 
is surrounded on three sides by the protected acreage of the National Park. It harbors more than its share of wolf, bear, caribou, moose, and other game, a local secret that's jealously guarded by those hunters and trappers who are aware of the anomaly. As soon as moose season opens in the fall, a handful of hunters typically pays a visit to the old bus, which sits beside the Shushana River at the westernmost end of the non-park track, within two miles of the park boundary. Ken Thompson, the owner of an Anchorage auto body shop, Gordon Samuel, his employee, and their friend Ferdy Swanson, a construction worker, set out for the bus on September 6, 1992, stalking moose. It isn't an easy place to reach. About 10 miles past the end of the improved road, the Stampede Trail crosses the Teklanika River, a fast, icy stream whose waters are opaque with glacial till. The trail comes down to the riverbank just upstream to for from a narrow gorge through which the Teklanika surges in a boil of white water. The prospect of fording this latte-colored torrent discourages most people from traveling any farther. Thompson, Samel, and Swanson, however, are contumacious Alaskans with a special fondness for driving motor vehicles where motor vehicles aren't really designed to be driven. Upon arriving at the Teklanika, they scout, scouted the banks until they located a wide, braided section with relatively shallow channels, and then they steered headlong into the flood. I went first, Thompson says. The river was probably 75 feet across and real swift. My rig is a jacked up 82 Dodge 4x4 with 38 inch rubber on it, and the water was right up to the hood. At one point, I didn't think I'd get across. Gordon has an 8,000 pound winch on the front of his rig. I had him follow right behind so he could pull me out if I went out of sight. Thompson made it to the far bank without incident, followed by Samel and Swanson in their trucks. In the beds of two of the pickups were lightweight all-terrain vehicles, a three-wheeler and a four-wheeler. They parked the big rigs on a gravel bar, unloaded the ATVs, and continued toward the bus in the smaller, more maneuverable machines. A few hundred yards beyond the river, the trail disappeared into a series of chest-deep beaver ponds. Undeterred, the three Alaskans dynamited the offending stick dams and drained the ponds. Then they motored onward, up a rocky creek bed and through dense alder thickets. It was late afternoon by the time they finally arrived at the bus. When they got there, according to Thompson, they found a guy and a girl from Anchorage standing 50 feet away, looking kind of spooked. Neither of them had been in the bus but they'd been close enough to notice a real bad smell from the inside. A makeshift signal flag, a red knitted leg warmer of the sort worn by dancers, was knotted to the end of an alder branch by the vehicle's rear exit. The door was ajar and taped to it was a disquieting note. Handwritten in neat block letters on a page torn from a novel by Nikolai Gogol, it read, SOS. I need your help. I am injured, near death, and too weak to hide out of here. I am all alone. This is no joke. In the name of God, please remain to save me. I am out collecting berries close by and shall return this evening. Thank you. Chris McCandless. August? The Anchorage couple had been too upset by the implication of the note and the overpowering odor of decay to examine the bus's interior. So Samel steeled himself to take a look. A peek through a window revealed a Remington rifle, a plastic box of shells, eight or nine paperback books, some torn jeans, cooking utensils, and an expensive backpack. In the very rear of the vehicle, on a jerry-built bunk, was a blue sleeping bag that appeared to have something or someone inside it, although, says Samel, it was hard to be absolutely sure. I stood on a stump, Samel continues, reached through a back window, and gave the bag a shake. There was definitely something in it, but whatever it was didn't weigh much. 
It wasn't until I walked around to the other side and saw a head sticking out that I knew for certain what it was. Chris McCandless had been dead for two and a half weeks. Samel, a man of strong opinions, decided the body should be evacuated right away. There wasn't room on his or Thompson's small machine to haul the dead person out, however, nor was there space on the Anchorage couple's ATV. A short while later, a sixth person appeared on the scene, a hunter from Healy named Butch Killian. Because Killian was driving an Argo, a large amphibious eight-wheeled ATV, Samel suggested that Killian evacuate the remains, but Killian declined, insisting it was a task more properly left to the Alaska State Troopers. Killian, a coal miner who moonlights as an emergency medical technician for the Healy Volunteer Fire Department, had a two-way radio on the Argo. When he couldn't raise anybody from where he was, he started driving back toward the highway. Five miles down the trail, just before dark, he managed to make contact with the radio operator at the Healy power plant. Dispatch, he reported, this is Butch. You better call the trooper. There's a man back in the bus by the Sushana. Looks like he's been dead for a while. At 8.30 the next morning, a police helicopter touched down noisily beside the bus in a blizzard of dust and swirling aspen leaves. The troopers made a cursory examination of the vehicle and its environs for signs of foul play and then departed. When they flew away, they took McCandless's remains, a camera, camera with five rolls of exposed film, the SOS note, and a diary, written across the last two pages of a field guide to edible plants that recorded the young man's final weeks in 113 terse, enigmatic entries. The body was taken to Anchorage, where an autopsy was performed at the Scientific Crime Detection Lab Laboratory. The remains were so badly decomposed that it was impossible to determine exactly when McCandless had died, but the coroner could find no sign of massive internal injuries or broken bones. Virtually no subcutaneous fat remained on the body, and the muscles had withered significantly in the days or weeks prior to death. At the time of the autopsy, McCandless's remains weighed 67 pounds. Starvation was posited as the most probable cause of death. McCandless's signature had been penned at the bottom of the SOS note, and the photos, when developed, included many self-portraits. But because he had been carrying no identification, the authorities didn't know who he was, where he was from, or why he was there. 